Hi, everybody. I'm Jim Skelly, and I'm here at Hampshire College in Western Massachusetts. Uh, and I'm just about to interview my old friend Michael Clare, who is Professor of Peace and World Security Studies uh, here at Hampshire College and in the Five College. He directs the Five College program here in Western Massachusetts. Um, and uh, among other things, Michael is. Um, been long involved in various issues related to peace and security, but in the last couple of years has, has become someone who is well known for his work on energy. And today I'm going to talk to him about the new book that he's just finishing up and which we all hope will be available to us soon. Uh, and that book is called The Race for What's Left, uh, looking at uh, the resources that uh, our planet still has and which people are going to compete over. Uh, intensely. Uh, some of his other books include uh, Blood and Oil, uh, Resource Wars, and more recently Rising Powers, Shrinking Planet, uh, which looks at the new geopolitics of energy. So it's great to be here with you, Michael, and um, shall we talk about the new book? And sure. What, what's the, the broad thesis and what are you covering in, in this work? And look at our friend here, if you will, a bit. Uh, well, the basic thesis is that the human species has pretty much run out of all of the fundamental resources that we depend on for industrial civilization. Oil, natural gas, coal, uranium, most minerals, and increasingly agricultural land. And that we are going to be in a intense struggle to consume, to, to find extract, consume what remains of the planet's fundamental resources, which are in those few parts of the world that have escaped plunder and exploitation up until now. And there are not many of those places. It's the deep oceans, the Arctic region, places like Afghanistan and Mongolia that for political reasons were left largely untouched, and the inner Amazon, inner Africa, and a few places like that. Do you expect uh, violent conflicts around the access to these resources? I expect all kinds of conflict, uh, violent and otherwise. I think it'll be a Darwinian struggle among corporations where uh, big corporations will have to struggle for their survival in an era of diminishing resources, so they will fight amongst themselves to survive. And the big ones will gobble up little ones. I think we'll also see a assault on the last indigenous peoples of the planet that still practice their traditional way of life in the far north, in the Arctic regions, in those parts of Africa that still, and, and the Amazon, that, that tribes still practice their traditional w ways of life. They will come under assault. I think they will resist to the best degree they can, uh, so there will be violence. When you use the title, What's Left, uh, last night you said to me you're talking about the crud. Hmm? Would you tell people what the crud is? Uh, well, good. Uh, when, when I talk about what's left, some of this is of a geographic nature, that is, places like the Arctic and the deep oceans that have not been within our reach before for technological reasons, but are now coming within our grasp. Some of it is of a geological nature, rock formations that escaped plunder in the past because it was too difficult or too costly to extract the resources trapped within. And this would include things like Canadian tar sands, or oil sands as they're called, and the heavy oil in Venezuela. There's a lot of this material that's left. I call it crud because it's not really petroleum, although they call it that. It, it's, it's really a tar-like substance, asphalt-like substance that has to be mined as if it were coal rather than oil and go through a very expensive, environmentally hazardous upgrading process to produce as syncrude, it's called, before it's usable. Uh, and so this kind of crud, uh, uh, stuff that you really wouldn't touch if there were any real oil left in the world, but that's all 
disappearing very rapidly. So out of our desperate need for petroleum, we're turning to these formerly untouched sources of fuel. You said last night that, for example, they could, you know, in principle, level the Rocky Mountains to extract oil from those mountains. Is that, uh, tell us about that. I oh, mean, all right, make, that, make that less polemical. Uh, yeah, that was a slightly exaggeration, but a large part of the Rocky Mountain area of the United States is composed of shale rock that contains a primitive, uh, really undeveloped form of petroleum known as kerogen. And this kerogen, this, this is really uh, shale rock that has not yet matured into oil. Oil takes tens or hundreds of millions of years of intense heat and pressure to, to develop. Uh, this is stuff that hasn't undergone that process. Uh, and to be converted into a liquid, it, it has to be heated to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Uh, so the rock melts, and then you could separate out the liquid petroleum material from the rest of the rock. In other words, you're doing what Mother Nature would do over tens of millions of years using artificial means. Now this is a very costly process because to heat it you need energy. So you're using energy to get a liquid out and it's also environmentally very hazardous because uh, you're going to endanger the water supply, you're going to produce mountains of tailings, leftover rock that's useless, uh, and it has many other uh, carbon emissions, so it's a very hazardous process. And yet, out of desperation, once again, Shell Oil and other companies are looking to ways of exploiting this resource. You also said that you're involved with uh, the Association for the Study of Peak Oil, and you mentioned that we're already past peak oil. Will you say a bit more about that? I mean, most people don't. I mean, I, I think most people wouldn't think about the fact of being past peak oil unless the, you know, they went into a place to get gasoline or petrol and there was no oil. So what, what does it mean? All right. I, I, I do think that, that the concept of peak oil is becoming increasingly well known, although not every aspect is fully understood. Mm -hmm. Peak oil refers to the moment in which the world's supply, the world production of oil, daily production rates reach their maximum sustainable level as measured in million barrels per day, cannot go any higher and begin to subside. And we know this is inevitable because if you look at individual country productions like the United States or the North Sea or other areas, Romania that were once very productive, reach a maximum point of production and then decline very rapidly as older fields are depleted. So we can be reasonably confident that this will happen on a worldwide basis eventually. Now, many of us believe that that point has already been reached or will soon be reached in the case of conventional liquid oil. That is, oil that when you drill into the earth out comes a liquid substance, crude petroleum, that can be refined into oil, diesel, and other useful substances. I believe that we have reached a peak in the production of conventional crude petroleum. However, the oil industry in its efforts to perpetuate the oil era is developing many forms of unconventional oil, like tar sands, of which I've spoken, heavy oil, kerogen, Arctic oil is considered unconventional. Deep offshore oil is considered unconventional. This will add, I would say, another decade to the life of the petroleum age, will add to daily production. And uh, I believe that we will see, uh, as I say, another decade before we'll reach a global peak and then begin to decline. Um. You, you also indicated that you thought the companies and the, the basic infrastructure that we're so addicted to oil that the imperatives to continue this process are really in place. I mean, we're not going to stop until something catastrophic happens. Yes. I, I believe that there is a confluence of forces that make that the case. 
For one thing, the big oil companies like BP and Royal Dutch Shell and ExxonMobil and Chevron, the biggest of the companies, Total, mm -hmm. and France, ENI, and Italy, they are their whole business plan, their mode of operation is to produce and sell oil and natural gas. They're not interested in selling uh, wind power and solar power. They don't market that. They have they have gas stations around the world and pipelines and refineries and gas facilities. They want to continue to use that infrastructure in which they've invested trillions of dollars. So they're desperate to find new sources of fuel to put into that infrastructure. They're going to do everything they possibly can to, to perpetuate the life cycle of oil and petroleum. They also have tremendous political clout. In the United States, they're the leading sources of funds for lobbyists and for political campaigns. So they have a tremendous political influence, and they use their political influence to get all kinds of favors, subsidies, tax breaks, environmental breaks. This contributes to the perpetuation of the oil age. And on top of that, as a result of past efforts, at least in the United States and Canada, we've created a life system, I call it the American way of life, dependent on highways, on cars, on suburbs, suburban lifestyle that require petroleum to survive. So many ordinary people, consumers, have a you know the, an addiction to oil or a, or a desperate need for it and so are going to look with favor on the efforts of the oil companies to to perpetuate this system as long as possible even if they see the faults in the system they live in the suburbs and there's no public transit where they live so they must have oil you um, you and as we were talking last night you gave a fairly grim vision of the future. You suggested that, I mean, in addition to the effects of our continued dependence on fossil fuels and the way in which it affects climate disruption, for example, um, you are suggesting that, that the world is going to be a very different world over the next 40 to 100 years. Um, can you say a bit more about that? I mean, it's it sounded, in certain ways, it's dystopian, although you have a a vision that perhaps out of the difficulties and challenges another world may emerge that uh, many of us would find more felicitous. Hmm. Well, you know, what we're seeing is the uh, the efforts to preserve a way of life that's obsolete and dangerous, the, a world based on fossil fuels and the excessive use of other materials, metals, iron and copper and titanium and cobalt and many other materials, uh, raw materials, which are going to become increasingly scarce. So as, as these materials become more scarce and the consumption of them it results in ever-increasing environmental harm, the price we pay in terms of, of, of dollar cost, but also environmental cost and conflict will grow higher and higher and higher. So you will have competing impulses. The, on one hand, the impulse to perpetuate this way of life out of desperation for as long as possible, and we see plenty of signs of that. And on the other hand, you'll see the impulse coming from many from young people pushing for an alternative way of life based on al alternatives to fossil fuels and a way of life that uses fewer resources uses them more efficiently and more economically and with less damage to the environment. And there will be a struggle, a global struggle, I believe, mm -hmm. between these competing forces. And I believe that over time, that those countries or societies that insist on perpetuating the old way of life are going to suffer terribly and will see eventually decline, economic and industrial decline whereas those societies that choose to move in the new direction will prosper. But in between, there will be terrible environmental destruction and conflict and economic devastation. You said 
uh, to follow on that, you said last night that uh, a number of countries you thought in certain areas of the world would probably be better off than others. Would you say a bit more about that? You did say something about Europe um, being less dependent already on fossil fuels, would you? No. The big, the big problem, uh, especially for us in this country, is transportation, because our system of transportation in the United States is overwhelmingly dependent on cars, cars, trucks, buses, yeah. everything powered by oil, mm -hmm. and we have very little alternative to that. We destroyed our railroad system, once the greatest in the world was the American railroad system, and and trolleys. Uh, what do you call them in Europe? Trams. Trams and the like. Uh, we had every American city was covered with trolleys. They were all destroyed as part of an effort by the oil companies and Detroit, the big big car companies, to force everybody to rely on automobiles. And the rubber companies. And the I rubber companies. companies they all tires, conspired. Right? Yeah to destroy that infrastructure. Yes. Most people don't know that Los Angeles, for example, had a fantastic had surface. Had the best trend. in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So as oil becomes more costly and, and, and more scarce and people are going to be forced to change their ways, we're going to be at a tremendous disadvantage because we don't have that infrastructure. And also, all, uh, all those means of transit are powered, can be powered by electricity. Now, elec Electricity has the advantage that you could use multiple sources of energy. Right. You could use solar, you could use wind, you could use geothermal, you could use new things yet to be developed. You could use nuclear if you believe in nuclear, uh, and, and other innovative approaches right. to, to produce electricity. So you have many options. So in Europe, where at least in, in the parts of Europe I've traveled in, where there are trolleys in every mm. city, connect to the railroads that connect to every city, high-speed trains. You could give up your car for most uses. You can't do that in this country. Right. So we're going to be at a tremendous disadvantage. I think uh, we have one video at the Global Conversation Course website uh, about the end of the suburbs, for yes. example. Suburbs are, uh, can't exist unless you have cheap oil and this kind of transportation system. Well, the fact is, though, that all of the new housing in America for the past 30, 40 years has been built in the suburbs. We don't have housing in the city, right. so people live in the suburbs and they have cars, so they're going to need that oil and they're going to have to get it from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, that might be biofuels, and that presents a problem because it might take up land to produce biofuels that's being used to produce food for well, other a, people. There's already evidence that food prices are rising where they have shifted to the production of fuel rather than directly for food. Uh, there have been some reports in this regard. What about you were, uh, some of our students have, uh, have heard you in uh, excerpt form in Gwyn Dyer's uh, three-part series on the coming climate wars. Um, you have a fairly grim vision of uh, desertification, all of these kinds of things that are a result of using carbon-based fuels. Um, tell us more about that. What, where is that going? What's From my understanding of the scientific literature on this, I'm not a scientist, yeah. uh, it is that uh, the, the effects of climate change will be variable depending right. on, on where you are on the planet. And some areas of the world will be harshly affected. Others will benefit in some respect. But it, it appears that the areas that will be harshly affected uh, are, include many areas like, like Africa, Central Asia, uh, Central America, that are already vulnerable because of, of poverty, and poor governance, and so you're going to have substantial collapse, an economic, political, social collapse in those areas. Yeah, we discussed um, the fact that this is going to result in a great deal of immigration. Ill immigration. Immigration from places attempting to, you know, for example, from Africa to southern Europe. Um, and you don't see that as being uh, solved in a happy manner either. No, I mean, the, the emigration will begin from interior rural areas that are desertified mm -hmm. or from coastal areas that are inundated mm -hmm. to 
uh, more slightly better off places. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding now is that a lot of the migration is going from desperately poor third world countries or countries in the south to slightly less desperate countries in the south mm -hmm. and it's, so it's creating conflict and hostility everywhere. i give you an example uh, there's been a lot of migration from Haiti to the neighboring country of the Dominican Republic right. and they've encountered tremendous prejudice the Haitians sure. in the Dominican Republic and are now being forced out so you'll see that you'll see a lot of migration to the cities from the countryside, these giant shanty towns developing where people will live in terrible conditions uh, without much opportunity for employment. And that's going to be a source of tremendous unrest of all kinds of extremism and criminal activity. And then there'll be the efforts uh, by the most uh, motivated, the most um, capable to move to the north, to the United States, to Europe, to China, and that's going to provoke tremendous resistance. Y you even suggested that uh, given what will happen in the southern states of the United States, and I'm sure you were joking, we wouldn't want to get our neighbors to the north upset, but you even, you know, just sort of jokingly said, you know, the United States might want to annex Canada. Oh, I, I don't think that's a joke. I think that's serious because if you look at things from a resource perspective, and I admit I look at everything from a resource perspective, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at some of these projections from the scientists about weather patterns and water patterns, the southern half of the United States is going to become increasingly uninhabitable because there won't be any water. Right. And so, where, whereas Canada uh, will be one of those places that might have more water. Right. And water is going to be in desperate short supply mm -hmm. for much of the world. It'll be, and the, the growing season there will increase, whereas much of the U.S. that now grows food will become a dust bowl. Right. And I, I can't imagine under those circumstances that people aren't going to begin to say, you know, why, why, the way we say in America, you know, the Middle East, that's our oil. Yeah. You know, we're going to say, Canada, that's our water. Uh -huh. um, well, I think a lot of people don't realize that the, the southern states, many of the southern states, Texas, Arizona, etc., are as populated as they are today because of air conditioning. That it, without air conditioning, it would be a much more difficult place to. It's it's not the air condition that makes those places habitable. I mean, they wouldn't be habitable in the first place without water. No, no, that, and uh, the of damming course. of the rivers, no. especially like I know you're I, I know you're talking about air conditioning is important. Yeah, but yeah. it's the dams on the rivers that made right. that possible, right. and it's the Colorado River more than any other river that makes that possible, right. and. Uh, some of the projections for the Colorado River are that it's going to be increasingly diminished no, to, and, and, to, and disappear at, at its lower reaches. And as you undoubtedly know, the Ogallala Aquifer under the Great Plains, uh, there are some projections that suggest that it will be dry in 25 years. In 25 years. O yeah. All of this leads me to think that Canada, with its abundant water supply, is going to start looking like a very attractive piece of real estate. Okay, so buy in Canada, that's the issue, right? I mean, <laughs> it's going to be bad, isn't it? It's going to be bad. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about the book. How are you organizing it? What are the other topics? Uh, that well, uh, you know, the, the argument in my book is that the, the human species, you could describe the history of the human species from when it began when we came down from the trees in Africa. Right. You know, human species began in a relatively small part of Central Africa. Right. And we consume resources like other species. And as we exhausted the resources in Central Africa, humans grew in population and moved further out in all directions. Eventually they moved into Europe and then into Asia and kept moving and as the resources, the land, the wild game was exhausted, they would move further afield. This is the history of the human race, human species. Uh, and 
much of more modern human history is about the efforts of various human societies to to uh, substitute for the decline of res of the resources needed to support their domestic population by acquiring resources elsewhere. The, in the colonization of the Western Hemisphere is nothing but an effort by Europe to supplant resource decline in Europe by acquiring the resources of Africa, the Western Hemisphere in particular, and uh, Asia, and so on. And, and this goes back to the Vikings were the first to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we've now reached a point where virtually everything within sight is occupied and is being exploited. So what I look at is the last, the final resource preserves on the planet and showing that they too now are under assault. The Arctic, the deep oceans, and the few pockets left and these geological formations I spoke about. So we're facing a crisis of humanity unlike any ever faced by any generation before. When we exploit these last final resource preserves, there's nowhere else to go. I mean, people tell me, well, there's the moon and space, <laughs> but that doesn't strike me as feasible, you know, not in real time. Yeah. So we face a crisis of unprecedented proportions where we're either going to adapt by using resources in an entirely new way, mm -hmm. which is to view each, each thing as we have to use it over and over and over and over again because it's uh, irreplaceable, uh, or, or we're going to fight to the death in a Darwinian struggle uh, I until human, you know, until the planet is just one giant war zone for what's left. And uh, that war that you uh, describe, how is it different from the wars that we've known to date? I mean, it sounds like, you know, war again of all against all in a way. Yes, it's and war of all against all. I, how is it different? Uh, it's it's different in the sense that there are no more frontiers. In the past, uh, Europe dealt historically by exporting its its excess population as one way of relieving pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people were uh, what's the word they used for the people sent to Australia? They were there's, they were transported. Yes, right, the same right, expression. Right, right, and planted. And planted elsewhere. Before Australia, they were sent to Virginia and to the colonies. Right. And uh, this, this it, it goes back to ancient Greece. The ancient Greek cities, when population grew too great and food was scarce, created colonies. The, the, the term comes from that. To it, Throughout the Mediterranean, around the Black Sea, to 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 relieve the population pressure and the resource pressure. So in the past, there's always been somewhere else you could send people. There isn't any place else to send people anymore. There's no other frontiers to exploit. We're at the end. So this is different in that sense. This is a terminal struggle. Secondly, the other thing that's very different, I mean, you can't, um, escape the significance of the rise of China and India. At this moment, at this precise moment, you have the most ravenous new consumers in the history of the planet. Mm -hmm. And and the, 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 the impact, because their needs are so great and growing so rapidly, that this process is happening at an accelerated pace. Well, and they, uh, I mean, data suggests that uh, amongst the Chinese, um, they're engaged in the most horrendous consumer practices as well. So the Toyota Prius, how many Toyota Priuses were sold last year in China? One. <laughs> right? They're all buying BMWs yeah, and but Mercedes. They, but they, the, pro the crucial elements there, the rare earth elements, come from China. Yeah, yeah. 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 So do you, I mean, if you, in the end, if you were betting on this, what do you think is going to happen? Well, <clears throat> uh, the way I, I picture it, I don't think I'll be around that long, but I, I picture something like uh, the Middle Ages when you had 
cities or the late Middle Ages where you had cities that were thri walled cities right. that are thriving, that have trade between them with one another, mm -hmm. that manage to survive uh, the chaos, but vast areas of deprivation, starvation around them, and waves of migrants trying to break into these prosperous walled cities and constant efforts, struggles at the walls to, you know, the, the, and the walled cities may be whole countries. It, it, you know, uh, Jeremy Rifkin uh, talks about the empathic civilization in his latest book. What happens to empathy in that uh, scenario? It, it, it's it, it, irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Um, anything else you'd like to tell us, Michael, before we, well, uh, we quit? Well, what we have been discussing is that this will be an environment that will reward innovation and creative adaptation. So cultures, societies that, that look at this picture that I've described and see innovative ways to adapt will prosper. And when I said prosper, I don't mean prosper in the mm -hmm. historic sense of having millions of goodies, because there aren't going to be goodies, yeah. but we'll be able to lead satisfactory lives by, through recycling of everything, through new ways of obtaining energy that are not destructive, uh, by building new kinds of cities that are green in all respects, mm -hmm. that grow food in mm -hmm. cities, that use their wastes in in recyclable ways, so there will be a priority on creative adaptation that I, th I think will, cre will, will unleash a new spirit of cooperation among people. And we see many signs of this all over the world. Mm. You can go to Europe, you can go to places mm. in the mm. United States and see this kind of cooperative ventures taking place. The people who are like most likely to see this interview are young people, students, etc. What message would you give to them personally about what they should be thinking about for the future and how they might adjust to this at a personal level? What should they be thinking about? Well, I, I, I would say the same thing I say to all of my students and my young son for that matter, which is to uh, look at the future I've described and figure out how can I best with my friends, because you can't do this individually, how can I and my classmates and my friends adapt to this picture in a creative, innovative, satisfying way? And I, I think there will be rewards for creative adaptation. I think of people who are settling in the outer parts of cities that, that in the past were abandoned, the warehouse districts of cities where rents are cheap and are creating communal lifestyles with gardens on the roof and cooperative startup ventures and y using a lot uh, using materials in a in a efficient way and using materials uh, recycling materials to create new products and are leading very satisfying creative lives. And, and you see this not in the romantic way that some people did in the 60s, not uh, in an ideological or romantic way. Is that not right? Exactly. I, I see this as creative adaptation and, to... And practical. Uh, to practical. Practical creative mm -hmm. adaptation to a harsh environment, but not without its rewards. Right. I think it's a it's a place in which creativity of all kinds will be rewarded, artistic as as well as scientific and industrial creativity will have a lot of uh, a, a lot of opportunity to to be expressed. Thanks so much, Michael. Sure. It's re I'm really delighted you were able to talk with us today, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot from the students who, who watch this. Well, I, I'll be pleased to hear from you, and I wish you all the best of luck. And if I were young, I would see this as a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I was trained once uh, when I was younger as an architect, and yeah. I didn't finish that career because of the Vietnam War, and I got involved in other things. but. If I were young today, I would want to go back to doing architecture, but thinking about green architecture, green mm -hmm. urban design, how to remake cities mm -hmm. as a green, livable place with low energy, 
costs, right. recycling materials, and the like. I think it would be a very exciting time for, for doing that. That's great. Thanks again. Okay. All the best. All the best. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. All the best to you. <laughs>